You're now watching the Mike Missinelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. It's the Mike Missinelli Podcast. It's coming to you on a Thursday, February 15th. I hope everybody had a wonderful Valentine's Day. Did you take your sweetheart out for a little dinner? Did you make dinner for her? Did you light some candles? Did you have some rose petals that led up the stairs and into the bathtub? Whatever you did, you might not do nothing. Because uh, a lot of uh, men blanch at Valentine's Day. So if you did nothing, you oh gods, then whatever. All right. So anyway, welcome to the show uh, today. Of course, and every day we are sponsored by the great people at Bet Rivers, where I hit on a bet last night. It might be a violation, but I got to tell you, I took the uh, the Miami Heat plus three and a half last night over the Sixers. You know, listen to me, it's a business. All right. I don't get involved in the rooting interest when I see good value. And on Bet Rivers, the line was three and a half Miami. I thought Miami could win it outright, but I took the points. But these are the things you get at Bet Rivers. You get these good opportunities. You take advantage of it and you bolster uh, your kitty until you get uh, to a point where then you can bet like you know, 200, 500 on something. All right. That's what I try to do. I inch it up and then I strike. But anyway, uh, today's podcast will have a special guest. I don't know how many podcasts around the nation would have a special guest like Steve Spagnolo, the defensive coordinator for the Super Bowl winning Kansas City Chiefs. We got Spags coming up in a little bit, so hang in there for that. In the meantime, let's explore uh, what we call the current, the things that are going on right now in Philadelphia sports. And I guess the top story has to be that baseball is beginning. Spring training in Clearwater, Florida for pitchers and catchers has started. So every day. We will now get a baseball report from Florida, which is always nice because it, it's the indication that springtime is coming. It's not springtime here, but if you go down there and see spring training, you, you have a little fun. Um, I got a question about spring training, though, that's always bogged me down. Why is it that pitchers and catchers report early? Why not the rest of the team when the same time that the pitchers and catchers report? I, I don't understand why you would give the everyday fielders an extra vacation. They, you don't want to hang out. Tony, you don't have to show up for a week or so. The pitchers and catchers have to be here, though, God damn it! I, and I, I don't understand it. Why, why do you give the everyday players a break when the pitchers and catchers have to go through the strenuous workouts, right? You would think that I, I have to laugh because in every spring training, they go, the pitchers are way ahead of the hitters. Wow, well, of course they showed up a week and a half early. Of course they're going to be ahead of the hitters. How did the hitters get a break? I never understood it. But that's the way it's worked. In baseball, you're reluctant to change. That's the way it's been done forever. Pitchers and catchers report first. You guys can stay home and just screw off until it's, it's time to come to Florida. It's astounding to me. Uh, but anyway... The issues for the Phillies, they're, they're not many, okay? They're running it back, basically. And the main issue right now is Zach Wheeler. He's due for an extension. We went this, through this with Nola. But Wheeler's still under contract, but you want to get him in and you want to lock him in at a better price. And they're talking about a price that is $35 to $40 million a year. And the big question is, would you commit $40 million a year for five years for Zach Wheeler? Uh, would you do that now or or would you wait? And, uh, you know, at the risk of sounding callous, I would wait. I, I don't know if there's any reason that, like, the price is not going to go up considerably if you wait. You, you're still, you still have, may have to pay the 35 to 40 million, but you don't have to pay it right now. And the thing about Wheeler is that, you, like, maybe if you're smart, and you don't wish for this of your team, but if you're smart, his performance suffers a little bit. Now that doesn't mean that he's lost it completely. We, we've seen periods of time where Zach Wheeler has suffered a little bit. He gets a little worn out and that's when you strike and you go, you know what? I, you want to, he wants to stay here. We want him to stay here, but uh, Zach, how about if we go and, and cut it like right in the middle and we offer you more than Nola and we'll give you the five years and we'll give it to you at 33. That's five more million than Nola. That's uh, our priority is that you're a better pitcher than Nola, so we're paying you more. But but he, they have no choice but to renew him, okay? So, the, like, forget about not re-signing Zach Wheeler. 
If you do that, you are running a terrible risk of giving away a number one pitcher to another team and having your fan base bitch and complain about it. So the Phillies are are in a position where they have to do it. All right. That's the the one thing that's settled. Now, how much they want to pay him and for how long is the, is the only issue. And I think you got time to figure that out. Uh, and, and you can give him the money he deserves, maybe at a little less than forty million, which might be his value right now. And you take it down a little bit. Garrett Cole makes thirty six as the top paid pitcher. Maybe you know, go down a notch and go thirty three for five years. That would work for me. Uh, all right. What are the concerns for the Phillies? Um, the concerns. If I, if I look straight ahead beyond the pitcher. And I see that area of the field. And then I move my eyes to the left. And that would indicate that my concerns are center field and left field. Uh, Marsh is going to be uh, in the picture somewhere. All right. He's got a little surgery. Marsh is the one guy you count on. Rojas is the guy that I um, I go, here are the reports. Oh, he's working out. He looks good. He's like stronger. And he's been working out with Kevin Long. You know what? You can do that all day, Holmes. It's like Ben Simmons making shots in off off season, right? You can do it. until you get into the batter's box and show me you can hit. Then I, I, those stories are irrelevant to me. And I think that Rojas is a guy who needs a lot of at bats in AAA. They are pushing this narrative that they need him to make the team. Maybe he will. Maybe in spring training he hits and it solves all the problems, but he comes the everyday center fielder, and then you can play Marsh and left. But if he doesn't hit, and you wind up having to send him down, who do you then play in left field? Which is why if I'm Dombrowski, I can't live with Jake Cave and Christian Pache in left field. I can't do it. So what do I have to do as a general manager? Well, I either have to sign Cody Bellinger, who's out there dangling like a ripe peach, or I have to make a trade for somebody who you know is a little more offensively efficient than Cave or Pasha. I can't, I can't go into a season, folks. I can't go into a, a season with Jay Cave and Christian Pache. I can't do it. I, you know, listen, I, they're a good lineup. And, and just because you don't have a left fielder that's going to produce, that doesn't, not the end of the world. You're still going to be in contention. But I would really like to solidify that particular situation. We're coming in here. And it's like broken glass with that situation. And everybody's ignoring it, except me. It's a concern for me. Rojas is a concern. Cave and Pache are a concern. So uh, whether it, maybe it's not a, a concern in Dombrowski. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Um, projections for Phillies victories. Very interesting. Let me bring producer Darren in here. Darren, can you give me... The top five team, the top five highest projected win total in Major League Baseball right now. Give me the teams or the number? Give me the five teams that are projected to have the, the highest wins from one to five. Because I want to see where you think Braves, the Phillies Do- I'm sorry, Dodgers, Braves. Oh, Astros. Um. Geez, I wish I had the, the, the strength. Right, are you going Phillies well, here? I, I know my over under is eighty four, so I'm pretty sure that's not the top five. I don't know that I. I think they need another starting pitcher. Now their projected total is ninety point oh, five. Oh, all right. Um, I did not know that. I thought it was eighty four. Maybe in Vegas. Maybe in Vegas yeah. that's the line, but the projected win totals. That are extrapolated. Right. Uh, the in, Phillies in are behind. They are fifth behind, you're right, yeah. the Dodgers, 104.5. The Braves, 105, 101.5. Uh, the Astros, 92.5. The, <laughs> the team you're missing. The team you're missing at the four spot. Marin could leave. Yeah, that's where I was going east. I'm wondering. Oh man. So Baltimore. Yes. Boom. The Orioles at 91 yeah. and a half. And then the Phillies in fifth spot at 90.5. And the Texas Rangers are next at 89.5. So there you go. Uh the Braves and the Dodgers run away winners as far as the win totals. And the Phillies in the in fifth in baseball in the pecking order. But if you look at the National League. 
they are third. So there you go. I much would rather them go out and sign uh, Jordan Montgomery. If they get, I, was, I don't trust Taiwan Walker. I think you're, you're going to have to get better pitching up and down uh, in, from the starters this year. So I would, that, he would be my number one target because also we're not even sure who the closer is going to be this year. True. They do have some pitching problems still. I get it. I, I need something more certain in left field and center field. All right. I, I'm okay with, with, with Marsh playing center field. If I can get somebody you can hit playing left field. I, I Listen, are you going to tell me that you're going to platoon cave and Pache in left field for me? Come on, man. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. Either. I can't do I can't, it. I can't have it. Hendry. I can't have it. All right. <laughs> Let's move on to the Sixers, and we'll touch on the Eagles a little bit because the power rankings came out for next year. Not favorable to the Eagles, by the way. But let's start out with Daryl Morey, uh, the uh, brilliant general manager of the Philadelphia 76ers. I put that in quotations for right now. Uh, word came out this week that he actually inquired the trading deadline, acquiring LeBron uh, and Kevin Durant. Now... <laughs> Now, I, this is funny because uh, I've been in sports for a really long time, so I know how this works. Maury wanted that story out there, even though it has no oh, yeah. chance of happening. <laughs> no chance. It's ridiculous to even call somebody to inquire about the availability of LeBron James and, and Durant. But he wants that story out there because he can con stupid people in his fan base, the Sixer fans, and look at that. He tried to get LeBron in there. That benefits, except for the smart people. Like me, I loved Rob like Polinka Garrett. of the Lakers' answer. I loved, I loved his reply. Yeah, yeah you, know, you know, you make an Embiid available. Yeah, yeah that's what, that's what <laughs> but you know, like, it's funny because uh, yeah, it's a PR thing for Maury because people go, "Look at yeah. that man, he's doing his job. He tried to get LeBron." Nah, come on, it's it's French pastry, as we used to say in the business. It's icing on a cake. All right, that's all I had to say about that. The Sixers lost last night. To the Miami Heat, again, I mentioned that a little earlier, after a big win over the Cleveland Cavaliers. I think the Cavs took them lightly. I think that shoddy lineup was good enough to beat them that night, uh, and the Cavs got a little bit of a surprise. But I, I want, want to, uh, the next game, I'm thinking they're going to come back down to earth a little bit, and the, and the Heat beat them without Jimmy Butler uh, last night. Well, today on the Mike Masnelli podcast, a very special guest. And, of course, uh, this guy is synonymous with Super Bowl victories. And, I think, uh, in fact, I think Spagnol in Italian in English <laughs> means Super Bowls. Uh, he is, of course, the architect of the great Kansas City Chiefs defenses that won another Super Bowl. We welcome in the great Steve Spagnola. Stevie, how you doing? I'm awesome, Mike. It's great to be on with you guys. Always good to get back connected to Philadelphia. You know that. It really is, because you're an honorary Philadelphian. And, in fact, you're my neighbor. You lived around the corner from me yeah. for a little while while you were, you were here in Philadelphia, where you were, you were idle until uh, the, the, the powers that be wisely uh, hired you back as a defensive <laughs> coordinator. And I, and I know you love Philadelphia. You married a Philly girl, yeah. uh, and you still love Philadelphia, even though you're a, you're a Kansas City guy now. Yeah, I love I always get back there. I mean, listen, we spend a lot of time at the shore in, in the summer, as you know. And anytime we can get through Philadelphia, see our friends there. Most of Maria's family has moved, but uh, we'll always have a connection there, Mike. I mean, we love it. I mean, I, it's hard to pull a Philly girl out of Philadelphia <laughs> without eventually getting back there, right? <laughs> yeah, and know. you married well. Maria is just the sweet, the sweetest of sweethearts. I love yeah, her. I, I'll kick my coverage for sure. Yeah, you did a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so let, let's talk about. L listen, I have to start because the, the current event that that yeah. is, you know yeah. become nationwide news is what happened uh, at the parade. And you guys like it, one of the major uh, uh, perks of of winning a Super Bowl is the adoration of fans going into yeah. town square. And uh, at the end of this thing, something crazy happens, and we get yeah. another mass shooting and. Uh, so, uh, first of all, you, you, just your reaction to that, and just tell me where you were at the time this happened. I know you guys were in the bus going back to the stadium, but w w yeah. when did you notice that this was going on? Well, so when everything kind of wrapped up on the stage, um, and, you know, we, we had been, been, been through it before a year ago, so you kind of used to, well, it seemed like there was a rush, rush, we need everybody off the stage, so we kind of, all got shuttled into what is the union station there. And then, then it was get to the buses. No, don't go on the buses. You can't go outside. Then eventually you find out what's going on. Right. And so there's a little bit of panic, but the families are there and 
coaches, players. And it got a little shaky because uh, one end of the building where we were supposed to go out for the buses, the police were holding us in there. They didn't want us outside for fear of what was going on. And then all of a sudden people started running from behind saying, we got to get out. We got to get out. Apparently somebody thought there was a shooter in the building. So, and then we all kind of busted out. And we found when we got to the buses is when we felt somewhat safe. And I'll tell you what, um, first of all, our hearts go out to the people that were affected mostly injuries and apparently one death. I'm not hundred percent sure about that. So our prayers are there first. And then I would compliment all of the police force that was there because they did an excellent job from what I understand uh, in diffusing it. Um, but it was, you know, it puts a little bit of a sour note on everything that went on yesterday, which was wonderful. And yet, you know, even Maria and I talked about it last night. We, we can't let the actions of one or two people, you know, ruin what we were supposed to be celebrating uh, in the middle of certainly recognizing people that were really hurt by it. Yeah, it's it's an unfortunate situation. It'll yeah. linger. And it'll put a pall on, on what should have been just a, a magnificent day for you guys. But uh, it certainly can't um, um, tarnish the accomplishment of, of winning another Super Bowl. And you know, Stevie, you you've reached now rarefied air, where uh, you know you've achieved the status uh, as one of the great defensive coordinators <laughs> that ever has been, and you, you're a part of, of all these Super Bowls. And, the thing about you that stands out is is your preparation seems to be impeccable to play the opponent. You study the opponent. You've got a lot of time to study him, and you go you come up with your strength against their weakness almost every single time, and that's very difficult to do. So let's let me take it back here to prepare for this Super Bowl. You got a couple weeks to do it, which with you and Andy having a couple weeks, the success yeah. just kind of flows from you. So what was your approach to prepare your defense for this game? Well, first of all, Mike, I would say this, and I, I, I want to get this out because I think this gets lost a lot. I mean, look at, um, you know, quarterbacks get a lot of credit that they take a lot of blame. Co coordinators get a lot of credit, and yet there's a whole staff. Like, I, I just want to credit the – the assistant coaches that we have on defense that do, do such a great job. But in answer to your question, Mike, uh, to be able to do it, you, first of all, you need players that will embrace any kind of change or tweak. <laughs> they don't all like to do that, to be quite honest with you guys. But we, we have a group that kind of embraces that. They want a new challenge. Let's do something new. Let's see if we can't confuse the offense. And then you have to have assistant coaches that will convey it to them. You know, the, the length, you know, that two-week time that you get, you know, with the Super Bowl, um, can be a blessing and a curse. Now, you know, Andy and I talk about it all the time. Uh, you can go, you can go overboard trying to make changes or do something different or have, or, you know, you see, you know, you get through one week of preparation, then you get down there to the Super Bowl this year, it was in Las Vegas and you want to make another tweak. You gotta be careful doing all that. And so we always have to check some balances, you know, get the right amount in. But I do think we had just enough tweaks in there. This offense that you guys I'm sure watched a lot of before the game. Weapons all over the place. It wasn't, you know, you can play some teams and say, we need to take that guy away and then deal with the rest. But the, the minute you tried to take one away, there was three other guys that could beat you. But we did feel like, Mike, that it began and functioned and ran through the running back, um, who was really hard to stop, Christian McCaffrey. And he did get his few yards and had some pass completions but what we didn't want for what we were trying to prevent was any the explosive plays the big plays whether it was a pass or whether it was a run I mean there were times there in the game where it was a little bleedy you know it was a six yard run and then you know an eight yard pass and but as long as they didn't get the deep they had the one trick play that kind of caught us although I thought Trent McDuffie was like that close to you know knocking the ball out it could have been a turnover instead of a touchdown uh, but our guys just made sure, especially on the back end, that they didn't get the explosive passes. And then up front, we made sure it wasn't a 20-yard run or a 30 or 35-yard run. So that helped. Uh, it is amazing to me how you disguise uh, coverages. Now, I, I'm amazed at how defenses, how you can coach defenses to do, like you have about 100 different iterations that you can use. And, yeah. and I just, I'm interested in how – how you call those type of things and how those guys know exactly what you want to do because it's so complicated a lot of the times depending on how the offense is going to line up. 
Yeah, this, and I'll tell you what San Francisco posed as problems, Mike, was that because of, you see them there, I think they led the league in pre-snap motion sh shifts and whatnot. So that, that makes it a little bit challenging. Although the way we did feel was if we could, and we take a lot of pride in the, the disguises and moving people around, our guys embrace that. We got a secondary that's smart enough to do it. Um, you know, I have to throw a, a call, a color, a number, whatever it is to tell them which way, because they all got to be doing the same thing. Um, but when you move a lot of people around on offense and we're doing the same on defense, sometimes, you know, it's harder for them to dissect what we're doing. Um, some, some offensive coaches might quite honestly will stay stationary in hopes of figuring out what you'll move one guy, let it sit and say, okay, I, I can see what you're doing, but that's the game within the game. Our players love that. I enjoy that part of it. And, um, you know, because we have pretty smart players, cerebral guys, we're able to kind of do some things that we wouldn't normally be able to do. Talking to Steve Spagnola, the great defensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs. He's got uh, all kinds of Super Bowl rings and just got the last one um, beating the San Francisco 49ers and, and snatching that game away from them and having uh, making more plays in overtime than they did. Uh, Steve, I think the whole world looked at this as your, ch your chore was, you, listen, Brock Purdy's a nice player and he's had a great year. But I, I would think that the whole world's looking at it like, okay, you as a defense coordinator are going to make him beat you. And one of the things you just mentioned about the running back, if you curtail that, he's yeah. got to make some plays. And he's still kind of a novice in this league. So is that was that part of the game planning? There, there was an element of that. Like, if, like when we started the preparation two weeks ago, you know, the early part of it, we didn't need a lot of crossover film during the year on San Francisco, AFC, NFC, right? So we didn't see them a lot. So you're throwing on the film for the first time and dissect them. And I, I wouldn't, you know, we had just got done. You guys will laugh at this, but, you know, we got just got done playing Tua, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson. And so you, every one of them can beat you with your, with, with their feet, right? So Brock Purdy, I don't know much about at the time. I'm like, okay, maybe we have a drop back guy that we don't have to worry about. But then you turn the film on and he's running it right through Green Bay on a scramble. He does the same thing to the their next opponent, um, Detroit. And so now we had the element of, okay, not, not only can this guy operate throwing, he's accurate and the timing and his routes and the you know, Kyle Shanahan system, he can beat you running the ball. And he almost did it in a scramble. We had Willie Gay on him. Luckily for that particular call, we did have a spy because we felt like he would, he could hurt you with his feet. But I, I looked at him, Mike, um, I, I didn't, I'll be honest, a year ago, I thought maybe if we could, force uh, Philadelphia's quarterback to, to beat you. But he was outstanding. So you know what I mean? In that game, I mean, he was out. And I'm like, we can't do that again. <laughs> you know, we can't say force the quarterback to beat you and have him have a game like they, they did a year ago. So we just needed, when, when it was all said and done, we felt like our best chance was to just function efficiently as 11 guy. You know, not try to take one away or just function really well as a unit, which really was the threat of our defense the whole year long. I, I remember talking to you last year about how you were going to defend Jalen Hurts. And uh, I, I thought that, that that was kind of more of a nightmare than, than defending yeah. Brock Purdy because of the way he, he did run last year. He didn't do it much this year, but he did run last mm -hmm. year. And, and that's that makes it like how, how do you – approach that as defensive coordinator do you do you have to spy a guy like that all yeah. the time i we did i mean we spied lamar jackson quite a bit josh allen quite a bit and tua although the one thing that helped us was the cold in that particular game because that was tough for those miami guys to come up into kansas city in like negative 30 degrees or whatever so god helped us on that one um but yeah you do have to worry and, and there were we thought if we could get san francisco into a couple of those passing situations. And we, quite honestly, if we were going to uh, commit guys to man coverage, backs turned and whatnot, we thought that if he saw that, he'd hurt us. So those were the times where we used, you know, spy. All right. And let's, um, let's look at the season because you know, during the season, there were a lot of people looking at the Chiefs as, uh, you know what, maybe – Maybe they've run their course yeah. and they're struggling, yeah. and and uh, and all of a sudden uh, uh, you got you got beat by by the Raiders, uh, and, and all yeah. of a sudden something shifted. What was it for you guys that that finally got got it back to being the Chiefs? Well, I mean, it all, it all begins at the top, and you you guys are familiar with 
with our boss here. I mean, Andy Reid's special with that. I mean, I, he, he never wavers. He's rock solid all the time, you know, whether it's good or bad. And I think that our guys, they feel that, and then they reflect it um, on the field and during the week of practice. And, you know, Andy was the rock that kept everything together. And we have, you know, we have some veteran guys over on offense. They were struggling a little bit, even in that Raiders game. I mean, I forget how exactly how it went, but I know we played really good on defense. And I know Patrick felt really bad that he kind of uh, let the team down, but it's not all on Patrick. Um, and then I think all the guys just kind of rallied together and realized that, look, if we were going to get it done, we had to go on a little bit of a roll here. And they did. The offensive line was terrific. And those guys, I love being around old linemen, by the way. I love, I love filtering and over to those guys during on practice or in meetings or whatever. They're great. Um, and I just think they just kind of said, hey, look, if we're going to be what we want to be or who we think we are, uh, we better get this thing together. I think that was a player thing more than anything. All right. Let's talk about Andy Reid a little bit because uh... – Play, you know, players will, will tell you the same thing. What you just said, he's rock yeah. solid. But he somehow has a way uh, of making players believe in their ability without him being a hard ass. Or yeah. I, it's, it's hard. It's hard to describe what effect he has on players that make them really want to play for him. So, and, and you've been close to him for so many years. What do you think it is? Well, first of all, Andy never has to. I've never heard Andy do a rah rah motivational. You know get you pumped up. He just does it by the way he handles himself. I mean, we all reflect a leader um, in their mannerisms and what they do, how they handle themselves. I think most people do that. If you believe in the leader, you follow their actions. And Andy, he never wavers. I mean, you never see him shook. Um, I mean, you guys know all the things that he had to go through in Philadelphia, and he never wavered. He stays rock steady. That's that's my... Um, that's my description of him. He's just rock, rock steady. He's rock solid. Um, that's just the makeup of him. Like that's real. That's who he is. It's not him trying to be, a, he's not behind closed doors, throwing books and, you know, and losing tantrums or whatever. He, that's him. I mean, you walk into his office, he's the same that way as he is in front of the team. And I think, you know, one thing about players, if they know what they're getting every day, you know, they, they'll roll with it. I mean, if you're up and down and you're all over the place, they're going to be the same way, but, the guy guys reflect the head coach yeah i was reading the story stevie about him and uh how he notices little things that that really don't mean anything except for the continuity of the program like he'll yeah uh, he'll be across the field and and one of your players will be leaning against the wall yeah and he'll and he'll notice it or he'll yeah. see somebody that has the wrong color socks on and yeah. those little things just it, 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 you don't do it with him you, you yeah. do it a certain way it's a, it's a detail thing. And, and I think, you know, I mean, Andy and I obviously sit in there and have talks, but when you do that, I think the players recognize that, whoa, you know, he doesn't say a lot, but he's still got his eyeballs at everything. And he does. And he'll whisper in a coach's ear, you know, go tell so-and-so this, or he might whisper in the trainer's ear, Hey, we need to you know, get that guy over. He should be rehabbing over on the side. And that's, that's what a good leader does. He keeps the pulse speed on everything yet. He does let everybody do their job, coaches, trainers, you know, video people. He's not, he's not stalking over people trying to tell you how to do things. He just wants to make sure you know that everybody's accountable. Uh, the transformation in his personality is also, you know, listen, I, I, I was doing Sports Talk Radio. He was here and yeah, we did right. battle a lot, and he was really stiff and time's yours and not give yeah. you anything. And now all of a sudden he's a commercial darling. How about that? He's like He's like a star. Yeah, and he's awesome at it. I mean, but that's him. I mean, Bobby, you've been with him, Mike, in, uh, in instances where it wasn't, you know, out in front of uh, a press conference or a presser, but – He's got a great personality. At least funny. I mean, he's fun loving. He loves all that. Like, but I guarantee you, I don't know this for sure, but I guarantee you, Patrick had to talk him into doing that. You know, the commercials you're talking about, because it's not him. It's not what he wants to do. But he loves. Listen, that they have a special relationship, and I'm sure somewhere along the way, <laughs> Patrick Mahomes talked him into doing it. And he's isn't he great at it? He grabs for those munchies or whatever. Or, those he's numbers, fantastic right? at it. I mean, yeah. the, the, yeah. uh, the State Farm commercials in the yeah. airplane. He, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, and I, go, I look at him, I go, is this the same guy that used to yeah. just, you know, we, he used to, like, battle, but not battle with the Philadelphia media. He just didn't give you anything. Yeah, you know, no. His personality that blossoms. 
I think he's, I, you know, I, I really believe he's enjoying where he's at right now. Look, at he's built this thing. It's established, kind of runs itself um, from the personnel to the coaching to all the organizational things. And he's had his uh, handprint on all of that. Uh, and yet he ha he's had people that have been here for a number of years. And I think he can sit back and do what he really l enjoys doing, which is coaching football. I mean, he loves offensive football. He loves being out there with the guys. Loves, you know, I go in his office. He's got a board in there and it's filled with, I always ask him, are there any run plays up there? It's filled with pass patterns and plays and, you know, and, and he, but he's great. He loves doing that. He enjoys it. He loves the pass. We're talking about yeah. like, oh, Steve, I got to admire your background. I love it. You're, you're from your office right now. I see a football field in the background, a practice awesome. field. It's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's a great backdrop for us here on the Mike Masnelli podcast. Yeah. Uh, let, let me just talk, talk about Patrick uh, uh, for one. You're a defensive coordinator. You're paying attention in your defense. Yeah. This guy is otherworldly. He's just the most phenomenal quarterback I've ever seen with just his will, his talent. Uh, the, the fact, I mean, he beat them with his legs yeah. in, in, in this Super Bowl. Uh, <laughs> when you watch him and you watch him practice what, or watch him in a game, if you get a time to look up from your chart. What yeah. do you, what do you, I don't see many offensive plays. <laughs> yeah, I was, but, yeah. But what do you like how when you see a player like that affect the team the way he does? What is what's that feeling like as a coach? for the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, I'll tell you, if you if you ask every defensive player, defensive coach, I mean, it, it, the one thing is, is you have complete confidence in, you know, even if we're not on point defensively, Patrick's going to find a way. You know, when you made the point, Mike, about that Patrick had those key plays, I've since obviously saw the game a little bit on NFL Network or something, um, and, he, and he did it with his feet. I when, when I saw that, Mike, I flashed back to when Donovan McNabb used to do that in Philadelphia, and it would be I, sometimes I would say when I was when I'd be up in the press box in Philly, and I, in, a, in the fourth quarter, you know, Donovan would decide I'm going to run here, boom, 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 they score, we win the game, right? And I, I would say to myself, I say, Donovan, why did you do that in the second quarter? Why, we would have been up by three touchdowns, and it would have been playing defense would have been a little bit easier. But those guys have a unique. I mean, Matt, listen, the, the guy's phenomenal. I'm talking about Patrick now, um, at understanding the moment, and that. All it was at that particular point was getting, getting, continue to get first downs, matriculate the ball down the field, and find a way to either score or tie it with a field goal. And he gets, he gets it all, guys. Like he, he doesn't miss a thing. You talk, you were talking about Andy, um, you know, Mike. With uh, he can be on the practice field and see somebody leaning over there, and Patrick sees everything too, but in a, in an amazing way. Like he's he's like at a whole different level now. He's not the head coach. So he's not telling people to, you know, take towels off or get your socks right. But, but he sees everything from a football perspective. I mean, I'll walk over to him and say, you know, we just, we just gave you that. You know, did that, was, it, was that challenging or not? And he might say, no, nah, that's easy. Or, you know, he might say, no, that last thing you did, you know, that, that's hard for me to turn the protection. So that back and forth I've always had with him, which I enjoy. But he's special. I mean, what you guys see is exactly what he is. Uh, it, it is uh, the 49ers go into that game as a slight favorite, Stephen. But everybody says, "Yeah, but it's Mahomes." And <laughs> there are very few quarterbacks that that have that reaction uh, on yeah. the public. Uh, yeah. And you know, you just go, hey, "It's Mahomes," so you, you can't possibly feel comfortable thinking the other side's going to win. Uh, so, uh, Steve, let me let me ask you specifically about uh, that, my my producer Darren's a football geek, and uh, he, That's a good he picked thing. out. He picks out certain plays, and and so he he wants to to get your feedback on the third and five, two minutes remaining in the Super Bowl, cover zero. You're showing quarters. McDuffie comes in on a slot blitz, uh, and and deflects Purdy's pass on a slant to Jennings, uh, and it might have been the play of the game. Can can you tell me what you called there? Well, uh, here's what I can tell you is that um, so if I remember correctly, I, I believe uh, we had a call. We put dime out. We had a call. They let the clock come down to the two minute. And in that two minute period, and you guys know with these commercials and all in the Super Bowl, they're all a lot longer, right? So there's a period there, yeah, where we we got to spend some time. And I, I, I at that moment, I said I, we need to treat this like a fourth down play. So I look at my fourth down list, and I what I did, man, and I, I do this periodically. I radioed in the, to Nick Bolton 
do I have all the trust in the world? We're talking about Patrick Mahomes and what he means offensively. Nick Bolton is our quarterback on defense. And I watched him. I looked right at him, and I said, Nick, what do you think about this? Like, I was going to change it to a – and I watched – I wanted to see how he reacted. And he immediately – head bobbed and then he's doing the signal for that particular call. So I knew that he felt really good about changing the call. So I changed it and we put a different group of guys out there. And fortunately for us, it was something that got Trent free and they, our guys actually executed it really good. They moved some people around and it, it looked a little fuzzy to me at first. Like I didn't think we were going to figure it out. We had a rookie in there, Chamari Connor, and, and he did figure it out. So, cause we hadn't shown that particular shift of motion against that pressure, but and Trent McDuff, McDuffie has been great with that all year long. Um, and, you know, we got a hand on it. For, and, you know, sometimes in the middle of it, guys, you don't realize the magnitude of a particular play. But, I mean, we all know if they had gotten that first down, what could have happened, right? The clock chews down, they kick a field goal and the whole thing. So, but I give a lot of credit to, to Nick and the, and the guys in executing it. Uh, you, you, your your cornerbacks are ridiculous. <laughs> you really are. That's kind of that's kind of really helped with defensive coordinator. Yeah. Now they listen. You, if you don't have cover guys in this league, um, I mean, we can all get enthralled with sacks and you know the big guys. Everybody talks about that, but what goes unnoticed, and you're you're on point, Mike. Um, what goes unnoticed is when guys like Trent and with Jerry Sneed, who I still can't understand why he doesn't get the recognition he deserves with Pro Bowls, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and then our other corners, Josh and Jalen. If you don't, there's times when they're doing it so well nobody notices because the quarterback doesn't throw it there or he gets sacked or he scrambles, but it all happened because we had some good lockdown coverage and those guys did that all year long. And that you can't, I mean, you, uh, no deep coordinator is any good unless you have some cover guys. Yeah. No, no question about it. Uh, I, I was looking for You know, I, I don't know what happened to you at the end of the game. I'm watching Andy. He gets the purple Gatorade shower. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. You, 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 uh, you took off somewhere. I, I didn't see you on the field. I was waiting for your guys to put you on their shoulders like Buddy <laughs> Ryan way back with the Bears, and you, you yeah. skedaddled off the field. I tell you, what happened, what I remember at the end, I mean, I saw the touchdown, and Drew Tranquil, who came to us this year from the, from the Chargers, who was outstanding, um, I, I knew that it was the first one for him. He had never won a playoff game, and uh, I had prayed during the week and, and during the whole playoff run that, just give him this feeling. And he was right beside me. He was, he had his head on the ground. So I just wanted to be with him for a moment. And then after that, Mike, I spent, I spent the next, seemed like forever, 15, 20 minutes trying to find Maria because there was a, we won an AFC championship here in our head. I don't know, three years ago or something. I never found her the whole time. And I was like petrified. I wasn't going to be able to find my wife to celebrate, but all that's fun. You don't know what's going on then, Mike. You can't find anybody. <laughs> Well, Taylor Swift, you know, they found Taylor Swift. She got she got on the field. She was more visible than the defensive freaking coordinator. For well, that's all right. I'm, good. I'm good with that. <laughs> but, but Steve, take me back to, to your career because it's, a, you know, it's a really interesting career. And, and you, you were here. Uh, the first time that I really met you, I was working in New York. And you're the coordinator after that and you win the Super Bowl. And I'm at the Canyon of Heroes with the parade yeah. and here you come in and you're going to be on the back of a flatbed and I run up to you and I introduce myself and you get off the truck and you're, ta you're, you're talking to me the whole thing. But that, that was after your Philadelphia experience. So tell right. me what you remember about landing here uh, and your, your days here in Philadelphia before all the, the glory happens. Yeah. Well, listen, so that was 1999. I mean, I, so here I'm a college coach, you know, I hadn't, Never really coached big time college. I coached at Rutgers University, which is, you know, at the time they were on their way up. Um, but always small schools, you know, University of Connecticut, UMass. And so I had had a connection with Andy Reid, and then Andy asked me to be a quality control coach there. And I thought, I mean, I, to me, it was like, you know, dream come true. You know, you're in the NFL and just going to be a grunt for however many years. And then fortunately, in, in getting hooked on with a guy like Andy, you know, he recognizes things in people and he tries to promote from within. And so he, and he kind of did that along the way. You guys know all that. And just my, t I mean, listen, special time for me. I, when you, when you can look at a city that you were in and say that you met your wife there, you know, you're the love of your life. That's pretty good. I mean, <laughs> that's a special city, right? Uh, that, that none of itself wouldn't, wouldn't matter how many games we won. I got a chance to meet Maria there and the people, listen, Philly's a unique place I, where it is that everything around it, the passion of the the fans there. I've always cherished that. I mean, 
you know, people, people say, think they're crazy. I say they're passionate. I mean, how can you not want to play or be around or work for a team that has passionate fans? So, like I said, there'll always be, always be a connection there. And it kind of, it kind of launched, you know, for me, it, working with Jim Johnson, Mike, who, you know, I mean, you know, how fortunate were we, you know, myself, Ron Rivera, Leslie, Sean McDermott, all fortunate to work. John Harbaugh, all for, fortunate to work for Jim. He was legendary. A lot of big names there. A lot of big Yeah, names. yeah. We had a, we, and he put together a heck of a staff and, uh, you know, we're all still pretty close. And I love seeing the success of those guys, what John's done and Sean's done. And Ron, Ron will be doing something someday. He's a successful guy. Leslie Frazier's now up in Seattle. Um, all these guys that are terrific and we're all part of that back in Philadelphia. Yeah, I assume you heard from all those guys via text after yeah. after this. Happened. I'm still trying to get through the text, Mike. I'm still trying. I feel bad because you know you go three days and you haven't answered one, but they it's a it's a good problem to have. No, I I totally get it. So uh if like there's three major fan bases you've been involved with. All pa- Eagle fans, yeah. Giant fans, a little different, but uh, Kansas City fans also uh, what what are, what are the differences between a Philadelphia fan, a Giants fan, and and a Kansas City fan? Well, I mean, well, the passion part of it's all the same, right? And they they love their football teams. Um, you know, I don't. Maybe they're a little easier on you here in Kansas City in the Midwest when you when you're not doing well. Um, I listen. They they all feel the same to me because you know when all three of the places you talk about, Mike, I've been fortunate enough, blessed enough to have been involved with some success, you know, uh, when that doesn't happen, you know, you get a different experience, but, um, the love of the people and the, listen, our game has grown so much since 1999, um, in a lot of good ways. And I think the fans recognize that. And it's always great to see people just gravitate towards something. Listen, everybody wants to be a part of something, right. And, and so it's usually something that's, that's good. And so when you're winning and you can help people, feel good about themselves in whatever they're involved in. And and you can see people come together and, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a real neat thing. Um, uh, Stevie, you, you also, you had that, you got the head coaching uh, opportunity. Uh, It's a tough thing to do because people want success right away. Yeah. Uh, And so after that, you came back here, correct? To Philly? Well, the in between, uh, Mike, I spent, uh, so after St. Louis, I spent a year in New Orleans. Then I was in Baltimore for two years with John. I just helped him for two years. Then I went back to New York. I had my, the three-year stint back there in New York. And it was after, it was after they, we had that rough year in 2017. Um, that was a hard year. That was a tough one. And then I decided, look, I'm going to take a year off. And that was the 2018 season was when I was there in Philly with you guys and spent some time over there at NFL Films. Uh, where Darren, you spent some time and um, enjoyed my time over there with Greg Cosano. It was, I tell you, it was a to sit back and see big picture NFL instead of being, you know, you see me here with, in my, you get in this tunnel here, guys, and you get those four walls. All you see is the next opponent, you know, the quarterback you're going against or the running back. But when you when you're not in the middle of that, and you can, you know, look at trends and the whole the whole league. That was, a, I thought that was pretty valuable. Yeah, it was great that you were here too. I, I get to know you a little, yeah, a little bit it. better. You're just you're living in my neighborhood. The whole <laughs> bit was it was very, it was very cool that hey, you were just here as kind of like a civilian. Yeah, like just, just hey, I was at cutting grass, chopping trees down, you know, yeah. weeding yeah. the yard, the whole thing. I I got to tell you guys this. So when you're when you take a year off, here's what happens: you you learn who the uh, mailman is, right? You, you, you learn the people over at the CVS because you got to go over there once in a while. When you're coaching, you don't see any of those people because your wife's doing it all. Uh, but it was, it was a different experience and a really good one. It was great to do it there in Philadelphia. Yeah, the last thing I want to bring up to you, you earlier in this interview, you said you matriculate the ball down the field. Yeah. Uh, I assume if you work for the Kansas City you Chiefs, say that? that's, that's got to be part of it because <laughs> it, it, Hank Stratton created it, right? Yeah. He matriculate the ball down the field. It's a Chiefs thing, am I right? It's probably up in some It's probably up in some saying in the wall here, and I've probably subconsciously read it every day, and that's why it <laughs> came sure out. It <laughs> subconsciously. Yeah. It's great. Stevie, listen, uh, you got a young team. And uh, yeah. they, 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 we just won a Super Bowl, but but this is the makings of a really long run because you guys are pretty young and still have great talent, and you have the you have the magic quarterback. So uh, you know what what's how long 
do you see this this going? The pressure will be on you to replicate it as well as, well as Andy next year because of this. Well, listen, let me tell you something, guys. In this business, there's pressure no matter what. Um, that's just part of this league. But, you know, I'm, I am concerned. I'll be honest with you. We we do have a lot of guys on defense that whose contracts are up. And, you know, the reality is you can't get everybody. So I don't know what it's going to look like, to be honest with you. I mean, we know Chris Jones is not signed, LJ Sneed. Mike Dana, Drew Tranquil, I go on and on. Derek Nadi. There's a lot of guys. I'm just thinking about, you know, our side of the ball here. Um, and, you know, to be so we get into the playoffs, you know, before the Miami game. And, you know, you guys know I'm a strong Christian guy, and I, I think this is all God myself. Um, you know, I'm, he's been merciful and graceful to me. But I prayed during that first playoff game, just please give me one more week with this group. I mean, I just love being around them. And I know that it changes. Like every year it changes. It won't be the same. We won't. Now there's some cornerstones that we'll still have, like Nick Bolton, uh, Justin Reed will be here. You know, uh, George Karloftis, who's grown, you know, he's going to be in his third year now. But there's a lot of guys, I know most of those guys we can't keep. And that's the sad part of, you know, this business and the way it's structured right now. Um, but yet, Listen, I want all of them to have all their dreams come true. And we know in, in professional sports that, you know, their lifespan of playing and when they can, you know, accumulate the, the wealth that they need is short. So they have to do what they have to do. So even though we're young, I know that was, you know, that's pretty well documented. Um, you know, we may lose some of these young guys. So it'll be completely different next year. And that's the challenge, right? Get another group of guys in and hopefully. Put Last question, Steve. Would really you good. be interested in another head coaching job? I would, Mike. Um, I don't lose sleep over it because I'm blessed to have the position I have. I mean, look at look at what's going on here. So I'm not going to run out of here. But you know, listen. That, I think you can ask anybody that's involved in in sports. And there's some pride. I, I felt like we did some really good things in St. Louis. I mean, we went from year one, one and fifteen, drafted a you know Sam Bradford. We're one game away in 2010 to go into the playoffs. We would have hosted a home game had we gone beaten Seattle and gone eight and eight. So I remember that. And then the lockout came and, you know, some things happened. So I, you'd always like a chance to prove that, you know, that's really what, what it wasn't about. We had some good people there. We built some things and, and pre, uh, created some culture. So, yeah, that's in the back of my mind. But, again, I always follow that up with saying, I'm blessed to have the job I have. So um, we'll let, well, we'll let God The trend is, uh, I, and I don't quite understand. Well, I guess I do understand because – fans love points it's, it's always an offensive yeah. guy yeah. who gets a shot instead of a defensive yeah. guy very rarely anymore the defensive guy and i think that's just faulty you know i love defense. i yeah. love a team that can stop the other team yeah well that and i mean i always felt listen mike mcdonald who was a was a quality control coach for me in baltimore in the two years i, I love and i think he's going to do a great job but i think what seattle did was smart. they 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 brought in a leader a person that they think can lead and then now you got to follow that up with some no no head coach is any good without a good staff. You know that's why we go back to Philadelphia, Mike. I mean Andy put together a terrific staff, and it made all of us better. Um, and hopefully Mike will do. But I use Mike in his example because uh, that's he's a defensive guy, uh, and I, I think he's a leader. I, I think you want. I think more than that, what I've learned in this league is is guys players will follow somebody that they believe in that can lead. Uh, the X's and the O's part of it, I think you get figured out. There's a lot of smart coaches offensively and defensively in this league. Um, so you just put a put a good staff together with a bunch of good players, and I think you can win for This has been a real pleasure for me, and I really appreciate uh, yeah, you, you doing this for me. Uh, I, I, do you wear the rings at all, or you just kind of stack them? What do you do? They're all in the safety deposit box somewhere, in, I think, in the Philadelphia area. Marie, Maria's in charge of that. So I think they're there somewhere. You know, her dad was a was a uh, Philadelphia policeman, and I believe that she still has the – I think there's a police and fireman's bank or, or credit union that, that – she. yeah, and we st – so Maria, I think they're all tucked. I think they're all tucked there, Mike. But I don't – I very rarely uh, – you know, I, when you're in college, you do f more speaking engagements. I schedule now. It's hard to do it. But usually you bring them to a banquet or something you're speaking at. But I, I don't do that as much anymore. So then I don't wear so them. You, you, you don't bling them in general when you go to, to no. CVS.
I'm not a blinger. I'd rather, I, listen, I, I like the memories and the, the relationships that come with it. And I guess someday I'll sit there and maybe put them all in front of me and feel really good about it. But for right now, it's really about Listen, best guys. of success for you. Say hello to the lovely Maria. Uh, and I will. Uh, uh, keep it going. All right? And enjoy enjoy yes. your off season. Get down there. Some warm weather. Yeah, we got a little break here. Play a little <laughs> golf down there. Relax. Yeah. All right? <laughs> Thanks, Well, You guys are the best. I appreciate right, it. Always good talking to you. Thank you. All right, that'll close it down for today. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks again to Steve Spagnola for joining the Mike Maselli podcast. Uh, as we're kind of like in a dead season now. We're, we're, we're waiting for something to happen baseball-wise. The early stages aren't exciting at all. And then the Sixers, we want to get this regular season to limp to the finish and see what they're going to be in the playoffs. So we're kind of in limbo. Uh, so we may have to go into some uh, other wild topics next week. I'll have another Lenny Dykstra story for you. In the meantime, you can get in touch with me, Mike at MikeMiss.com. You can check me out on Twitter, MikeMiss25. Uh, and speaking of romantic, if you want to take a trip down to the winery called Natalie Vineyards and Cape May Courthouse, go down there and share a bottle of red amongst the vines. It starts to get a little warmer. You sit outside. We've got the tables. We've got a, uh, the, our propane fire tables that you can sit there and get romantic with and uh, share uh, a day uh, bottle of wine. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, and have our crudités that we have there. Uh, and also, if you want a cameo shout out, I, you know, I was willing to give you the love messages for Valentine's Day. So if you want to you know, t- take advantage of that, you didn't do anything for Valentine's Day, you want to send her a little love message, go to cameo.com and look up Mike Missanelli and I'll give you a personal shout out. All right. I think that's about it for today. Everybody have a great rest of the day. Have a great weekend. And we'll talk to you next week on the Mike Missanelli podcast brought to you by Bet Rivers. See you, everybody.